quality specifically can be learned without being a craftsman. It's easy to spot poor quality when you start seeing really great quality. What's up guys, it is Coffee Break episode number 23. We've got a couple questions to answer today. And as always, remember, if you have a question to ask, whether it's a site vi- based on a site visit, what you see on our Instagram, whatever it may be, drop it in the comments below. We'll do our best to answer this every single week. Let's get right into it. Uh, this actually goes back to an earlier Coffee Break. What changes have you made to your contract to address last minute cancellations? Uh, I recently talked about this on our podcast as well about cancellation for convenience. Uh, and I actually stumbled over that word and I forget which episode it was. Uh, I never did get that thought. And I remember texting Tyler just a few days later. Now I remember cancellation due to convenience. And that's what this is about, you know, last minute cancellations due to the convenience because you know oh we don't want to do this anymore or we've chosen that it's too expensive or whatever the case may be there's a lot of costs that you know are put into that project up into that point you know and to speak specifically because this doesn't happen a lot but you're you're saying no to work because your schedule is full you're lining up subcontractors you're getting materials ordered you're getting general conditions materials ordered like temporary toilets site protection things like that there's all these costs so you know the changes that we've made to our contract and i'm not going to get into the the, the nitty gritty specifics because it's something that we're currently working on but one of the, the very specific things is a penalty fee uh and the penalty fee isn't really designed so it's so you know to make money if if someone cancels on us because there may be a good reason maybe they just can't uh afford to that penalty fee is designed to protect us and protect us in a couple ways protect us in the sense that we've said no to work we have this schedule you know planned out for x amount of months or a year and if that gets canceled we don't have that income in and that's going to affect our overall sales and we have to kind of jump around and, and, and start selling more work to try to fill that spot so there's going to be this you know downward uh trend in our graph you know our, our income graph but the penalty fee is also designed so people don't take advantage of the the pre-construction or the pricing strat uh portion of what we do and to kind of rehash the pre-construction side of it people hire us for pre-construction we work through scheduling we work through pricing we work through you know uh lining up trades we go through all of this process and right before we start construction we have a really comprehensive you know outline of hey this is exactly what this is going to cost these are the 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 prices that we have committed here's our project schedule we're basically putting everything on the table as how we're going to run this job and what it's going to cost and for someone to cancel they have all this information and can essentially take that and then go bid it to another contractor and we need to prevent that we want to, you know that's where that fee comes in where if you know before our contract was written where that we would just be covered for our hard costs for that project Essentially, it's the time that we're putting into it. You know, yeah, we'll be account, we'll be uh, compensated for all that time, but we're so far down the path, and we're putting so much effort and and handing over all the, these documents that you know are really helpful to the bidding it to another contractor, and for them to cancel and get you know their deposit back less the cost. They're into it for such a small amount. So to protect us as a builder, we've added this clause to you know essentially. I don't want to call it a penalty fee. I keep saying that, but it's essentially a cost to, um, you know, for cancellation due to convenience. What that cost is, is what we are trying to narrow down. Uh, We had a tremendous amount of people kind of reach out when we started talking about this originally. Hey, you should take X percent or it should, you know, some have even said that you keep the entire deposit, which, you know, financially, yeah, that sounds great, but there's a lot of reasons why I don't think that is fair. Um, but you know, that's something that we're going to kind of unfold more. And, and I hate that I'm answering this without, you know, the specifics, but you know, in, in the, the big picture here, 
every time we run into a situation like this that we run into you know something that we're it's a lesson learned uh with a client uh, a poor experience we take that opportunity to you know sit down with our lawyer and chat you know hey how do i prevent this in the future you know i don't want to be in a position where someone can cancel the contract due to convenience again so what can what am i legally allowed to you know put in there you know and right you know i think originally or i know originally it was really gray because it talked a lot about how long the contract was in place and that they had X amount of days to cancel it. And then after that, you were only allowed to bill your actual cost. But the closer you get to a job, the more those costs become more deep rooted and there's no way to, to scale, you know, at what point of the, of the pre-construction are you that, you know, deems you the right to bill for more than just your hard cost on that project. So it's really helping define that space. Uh, and when we do define it, I'll be happy to to share that. But you know, just as a as a as a big picture here, again, you know, anytime you run into a situation where you know it, it doesn't work out in your favor, whether it's a bad client or a bad situation. It's, it's great to have a lawyer on retainer. That's who helped us develop our contract in the first place, but that's who you want on your side to help you control or help you adapt and add to that contract to protect you from future projects. So question two, do you think you can achieve a quality like yours without having been a tradesman or a craftsman of any sort? Um, I do, and I think the, the, the reason being is that it's not necessarily about the craftsman side of it. I think, you know, I look at project managers, you know, there's three project managers here uh, at our company, and all of them have very different backgrounds, and all of them have very, uh, you know, very strong uh, strengths in some areas, and not as strong in other areas, and they all vary. So, you know, com- become, you know, being a carpenter growing up, you know, growing, you know, into this trade hands on has led me into the position I am today. But if I didn't have that carpentry experience, I don't know, I can't speak to whether or not I'd be in the same position. You know, I know plenty of guys out there that, you know, never were on the tools and still have the opportunity to, you know, deliver a really quality product and I think it just comes down to personality and 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 the strengths in which you're given you know I think about architects you know there's constantly a a comment made that an architect should always build something before they 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 design because you know designing some you know designing something on paper doesn't always translate to how it gets built in in real life and while I do uh appreciate that and agree to it I'm I'd be foolish to think that there's not architects out there that have never built a home that still build to a level of quality or design to a level of quality that it probably surpasses us. Um, And I think it really just, you know, again, goes back to personality and what your strengths are and really what you, you focus on. And, you know, to speak to quality specifically, there's so many layers to that, whether it's quality of materials, and what does that mean? Is it longevity? Is it health? Is it durability? Is it, you know, the carbon footprint of it? You know, all of those things can be learnt without being a craftsman. You know, the quality of, you know, joinery, same thing. It's, you know, you, it's, it, it's easy to spot, you know, poor quality when you start seeing really great quality. So, you know, surrounding yourself with others that might be quality craftsmen or, that just put out a quality product or just even social media in general, I think that has really driven us to uh, the level of quality that we're producing at now is because we're so immersed in really great craftsmanship and quality and, and crazy projects that make me, you know, micro analyze everything we do to, you know, man, like, look at how they achieve that. How do we dissect that and do that ourselves? And I haven't been on the tools in my company and years at this point and I feel as though us and you know myself individually but even more importantly the company continues to grow because we're constantly pushing ourselves and analyzing what we're doing compared to you know some of the the greats out there that we you know look up to whether it's design or whether it's you know trade oriented that's really what drives us and I think to to grow up and in you know in this industry without that hands-on experience while i do think it's you know 
I, I recommend it. I think, you know, that that was my some of my favorite years. It's absolutely doable. It's just you have to immerse yourself and surround yourself with the people that are going to drive you to be better and challenge what the status quo might say. So I got two other questions. I'm going to answer them. Um, I'm going to answer them both. I told Doug I wasn't going to answer one of them. How do you make any money with all the labor suck? Talking about way too many dudes on the job site. Well, there's a lot of different ways, but you know, with respect to that, we are, you know, every person that is that is working here, especially hands-on carpenters, cabinet makers, things like that, they're billed at an hourly rate and they're billed to the client that way. And that's, you know, communicated up front. So a client understands that when we're producing and we're executing work, they're they're billed at an hourly rate, cost plus time and material, whatever you want to call it. Those guys are there and they're, that time is allocated ahead of the job. You can go back to one of our previous episodes when we talk about pre-construction, but we look at these tasks and figure out how many man hours does that take. Yes, there's some times where you watch a video like the steel post being cut and there's six guys around there. You know, maybe it looks like they're not doing much, but then, you know, grabbing the edge of stone and getting it into place here and there. But the reality is they're there for eight hours and they're doing other things. And at that moment in time, they needed an extra hand. So the guys jumped in and and made sure that they got that stone installed. You know, these guys have tasks and setting them up. You know, it's something that we work and talk about constantly is making sure that we have a clear understanding of how much time we have to complete tasks. And, you know, especially on the higher end detailed stuff, it's really hard to to fully understand just how many man hours it's going to take, but making sure that we're tracking it and we, we track all of this stuff through our build a trend time clock sheet. And we're, we're, we have this allocation of time and we're seeing it on a live, you know, daily being able to see daily how many man hours and how many dollars that equates to, to the budget that we had allocated for that project. And we can sit down with the project manager, whether it's in our weekly meeting or a phone call or a text and just, you know, kind of trigger, hey, you know, we're, we're starting to run run the clock over this, you know, how are we doing? Why are we running over? Are, you know, are we, do, you know, we have to have a conversation with the client. Do we need more time? Are we able to offset this by, you know, not having to do as much work in another phase of the project? comes down to communication and, you know, setting expectations with man hours. So yeah, there's a lot of dudes. Uh, and it, you know, it might be a money suck, uh, in, in some ways, but that is, you know, translating into the, the product that we're, that we're selling our client and more importantly, the product that the client is expecting from us. Last question. Uh, someone talked about the concern for forcing radon into the adjacent spaces. And this was based on last week's site visit, two weeks ago, site visit, site site visit, (laughs) site visit two weeks ago. See what happens when Doug chimes in, Um, where we talk about the stego wrap, sorry, stego wrap on the top of the concrete slab that we're gonna run up the walls. This is in a a multifamily condo building. uh, And we're talking about trying to mitigate the radon. And originally we were gonna go with this uh, slab depressurization system, which is typically that four inch PVC pipe that comes out of the slab and vent- ventilates up through the roof. We couldn't, we couldn't capture any of the air into the slab. There was no pockets of air. So we couldn't track that right on. And, you know, until we did, until the client actually did some research, we didn't know that, or the, the building didn't know that there was a radon issue. As far as if we're, we're concerned with forcing radon to the adjacent spaces, we're not. And, you know, and I'll speak to that because, you know, right now the, the slab has, you know, uh, imperfections, maybe cracks or micro holes and things like that, that maybe things are leaking up, but this is building wide there, you know, it's, it's not a red flag warning, but the entire building is dealing with this. And we're talking about one unit within that. So we're working together with the building and the, the radon professional to come up with an overall solution but our scope is the client's home and making sure that what we're doing is capturing the air within the space and you know yes we're doing we're, we're building this air type barrier around the unit but we're filter filtering the air because we can't be completely airtight we're still connected to the common space the common door and the common walls but the goal is to you know essentially be able to maintain the air within the space and we're going to primarily do that 
by creating positive pressure. And that means we're going to be exhausting, let me say this right, 200 CFM and, in, and then bringing 300 CFM into the unit. And essentially what that's doing is it's keeping the balloon filled up. So we're only releasing a little air and then putting more air into it rather than the other way. If we were under negative pressure, it would look for air in those cracks and holes and try to draw up through the slab or any of the imperfections in that air barrier. So keeping the place under positive pressure is going to be what helps us combat the radon. Uh, again, I'm not a radon professional. We're working directly with a uh, professional for this. Don't take my you know, word for how we're uh, approaching this. If you're dealing with radon, I absolutely recommend that you work with a professional uh, and work through this. And even if it's in a multifamily or single family, it can be a very serious uh, health, health concern. And that's exactly why we chose to bring in someone that could walk us through the necessary steps that were going to net the, the, the best result for us and work for a result for the entire building. So as always, guys, we appreciate you watching Coffee Break. We'll see you guys next week. Oh, and make sure you guys subscribe. Oh, and turn on notifications. Do all that stuff. We'll see you then.